Well, good morning, everybody. I'd like you, if you would, turn with me in your Bibles once again to Galatians, and we're going to be reading from chapter 3. We're going to be reading from verse 17 of Galatians 3 down to the end of the chapter, down to verse 29, and we're going to be considering the relationship between law and promise in this section this morning. And so beginning in verse 17, it says this, and this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of non-effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promises the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid, for if there had been a law given which could have given life, Verily, righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And again, God would bless that reading of his precious word to us this morning. We've been learning in this epistle how the Galatians are being bewitched by false teachers to go back to the law and to uh, abandon the position that they once held uh, of uh, grace and, and embrace law uh, as uh, a means of, uh, in a sense, saying that, that grace was not enough. We need this supplement of law in order to uh, please God. And so these false teachers have brought this teaching in. It had had quite an impact on the disturbing the saints, as false teaching always does. It has a means of disturbing the people of God. And so Paul is showing uh, that it's a folly, it's absolute foolishness to go back to this system. Uh, and it's kind of going back in God's revelation. You, you, it's a kind of like putting the clocks back. It's not a good thing. You're going backwards rather than moving on in God's revelation. And so one of the things that Paul has shown in this chapter is that uh, they didn't receive the Spirit uh, by the works of the law, but it was by faith. They didn't uh, also um, get justified uh, before God by the works of the law. No flesh can be justified by the works of the law, but it was by the hearing of faith. And so up to now, everything they've received uh, as people has come to them through grace, not through the law. So why would they want to add law to it? And what they were saying is, well, you know, kind of promise, uh, the promise that would, which is given to Abraham, uh, that through him all the nations would be blessed. Well, after that came the law. So the law must add something. It must be beneficial. It's because it came afterwards. And so Paul is showing that actually there was a reason why the law was given, uh, but it certainly does not take away from the principle of faith and the promise uh, of justification by faith, which was given to Abraham back in Genesis 15. So we want to just kind of look now uh, at this kind of contrast between promise and law, which is brought out so beautifully in this section. And so we notice in verse 17 that 
indeed, uh, law came much later. It says, "This I say, the covenant, verse seventeen, that was confirmed before the God before uh, of God in Christ, the law which was four hundred and thirty years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect." And again, the thought is this: that uh, uh, he, this covenant of promise that God made with Abraham, it can't be changed. Just like when we make a human promise, and he'd mentioned that in the previous verse, uh, for instance, write a will out, it cannot be changed afterwards uh, by some other party. Uh, it's it's confirmed, and so it cannot be disannulled or added to. And so that's the thought here. And so although the law came afterwards, it doesn't take away in any way from the promise uh, and the God using this system of promise. And so notice it talks about this idea of 430 years after that the law came in. And we want to just think about that for a moment, uh, this uh, idea of it coming afterwards. And uh, we just want to look back just for a second, please, at the book of Exodus, uh, where we get this idea of 430 years. Book of Exodus and chapter 12. And verse 40 and 41, and it says, Now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwell in Egypt was 430 years. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the selfsame day, it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. So again, the promise made to Abraham was long before this, right? And so although Paul's not so much concerned here with, with Old Testament chronology, he's making a very telling point. And the point is this, the law was given hundreds of years after the Abrahamic covenant, and it couldn't annul or weaken it in any way, the original contract that God made with, with Abraham. So what we say is the law, it had a place, it had a purpose, but it was never intended to replace the original and holy unconditional covenant that God had made with Abraham. And so he says in verse 18, for if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. And so if works of the law are added, it ceases to be promise. So if you could illustrate it this way, suppose I made a promise to one of my children and I said, uh, I am going to give you a brand new MacBook Pro laptop for Christmas. Okay, I'm a generous father. I'm going to give that to you. And it's a promise. And that promise is a promise. It's uh, backed by the integrity of my character and pledged by my given word. So... My child will be eagerly anticipating his Christmas gift of a brand new MacBook Pro. But if a few weeks later I were to add some conditions, some rules and laws that the child had to obey uh, if she wished to get the present, or he or she wished to get the present, I would have first of all perjured myself because I've broken my promise because I'm now adding to it uh, requirements. Uh, I would have changed the ground rules. I would be making the attainment of the coveted object hinge upon works, something that had to be done to earn the reward and not my original unconditional promise to give it as a gift. You see that? So that's this is the principle that Paul is bringing to us here. It would no longer be a gift, but something to be earned. If I start adding, well, you know, okay, I'm going to give you this laptop, but you have to wash my car every week. You have to do chores. You have to, you know, all these other things. When I just said, this, is, I'm going to give you this, that's, you know, and it's based on my promise, my character. And so when God makes a promise, his character, character is such that it's impossible for him ever to go back upon his promise once he has given it, okay? So he's made this promise, and he cannot, his, his very integrity is at stake. And so adding the law is certainly doesn't take away from the promise here. There's got to be a different reason. So why is this law given? We would say that one of the things this passage is going to teach us is that law is inferior to promise. So, for instance, notice verse 14, it says, wherefore then serveth the law. What's the purpose of the law? 
Notice it says it was added. <laughs> so it's it's something added, and there's a purpose that it was added. It, so it's it's supplementary. Uh, it, it's um, and therefore because it's a supplement, it's inferior to the original promise. And what is the the purpose of this addition? And again, just to say this, the inferiority of the law is emphasized in that it was inferior. Uh, for very various reasons. In fact, we're going to see three ways in which the law is inferior to promise in this following section. And so <clears throat> we've already seen that the law was unable to behold the whole, bestow the Holy Spirit, was unable to justify a man. It, it actually brought a curse. Whoever puts themselves under it is under a curse. Yeah, and um, uh, and so it, it, already we've been seeing that it's inferior in many ways to the, the, the promise. But he's going to add some other reasons. So the purpose for which it was given is brought to us now. It was added, he says, because of transgressions. Wherefore I serveth the law, it was added because of transgressions. N notice it doesn't say because of sins. It was given to expose the nature of sin. Not because knowledge of sin was uh, unknown, but to show that sin is actually rebellion against God. That's that's the reason. It's added to, to show that it's we're actually crossing a line here. We're, we're breaking a law. We're actually going across a line that God has laid out. And so it's showing the, the inner rebel in every one of us. And so I want to just uh, talk about kind of how the law helps us to really understand what we really are uh, as sinners and rebels. So I want to just uh, refer to several references here uh, where it talks about the law in connection with sin and showing us uh, that we really are transgressors, we're lawbreakers. So Romans 3.20, I want you to notice this. Uh, just uh, it says, therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. It really shows me what a rebel and what a sinner I really am. Uh, look at Romans 7 and verse 7. Romans 7 verse 7 what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid, nay, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. So again, Paul would say, even in his own experience, the law was instrumental in showing him what a rebel he really was. Uh, and particularly, thou shalt not covet. We're not sure what it was that he was coveting. We're not given the description of it, and I'm glad we aren't because it it, it kind of makes it relevant to all of us. But uh, that we sh you should not covet, and that's what kind of revealed to him. Well, he's not satisfied. He's wanting something. Uh, he he's guilty of covetousness, and so it revealed his true condition. Look again back in Romans five and verse thirteen, and we're going to see the consistency of Paul's teaching here. He says. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. And so you can't be fined for breaking a law if there isn't a law. So if I go through, uh, say, a, uh, a school area at 90 miles an hour or, well, I don't know, 140 kilometers an hour, and there's no sign up, um, it's still an irresponsible act. <laughs> I know there's children there. Uh, it's still, uh, you know, showing that I don't care about people. But when when there is a definite speed limit that says 40 kilometers an hour and I thunder through, then I'm guilty of as a lawbreaker and I'm a transgressor uh, in every way. Romans 7, 13, again, just to see this principle brought out. Was then that which is good made death unto me, God forbid, but sin that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. And so the law is added in a sense to complement the agreement. To, it's really designed to show us how desperately we need to be justified 
by faith you see it's showing us what rebels we are what sinners we are and of Again, we often can use that illustration of, of law bringing out our inner rebellion. And you've heard the various illustrations. Um, when you see a sign, wet paint, do not touch, the first thing that you think in your rebellious mind is, I wonder if it's dry yet and you want to touch it. You see, and that's just, that's the way we are. That's the way we're wired. And so he, he brings this out. Uh, the word added here, uh, given in addition to the promise, given to emphasize transgressions, uh, it, it not intended as a, ever as a means of justification. It didn't bring salvation, but showed men their need of it. That's the point of the law, to show men they needed God's grace, God's promise of justification by faith. Uh, uh, law was essential for that. And that's why we often say that in gospel preaching, it's good sometimes to do a law work before we point them to the solution. Get men lost before we get them saved. And one of the ways we get men lost is through the law. And you've heard all the illustrations. The law is a, is a thermometer. Uh, it's not designed to make men well, but to show them how sick they are. The law is a ruler like a stray edge to show men how crooked they are. Uh, I've often used that illustration. I've got a, one of these note-taker Bibles, and when I write in, it always looks neat until I have to underline it. And when I put the ruler there, I notice I always go up to the right all the time. My writing looks good, but it's really crooked when you put a straight edge up against it. And so that's the, these are various illustrations that are often used to show the purpose, the real purpose of the law. Wherefore then serveth the law, added because of the transgression, Notice this, till the seed should come to, to whom the promise was made. And so not only do we see the purpose for which it was given, right, to show us that we're transgressors, to show us that we're, we're people that are lawbreakers, we're inner rebels, it also, the period for which it was given, it's not permanent. Notice this, it's, it's given until, and so it says, uh, what wherefore serveth the law was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made and it was ordained by angels so the period it was given it limited in duration as opposed to the everlasting covenant god made with abraham uh, this uh, and again hebrews 13 20 would talk about this everlasting covenant this is temporary it's only until the seed should come Galatians were trying to put the clock back dispensationally. The seed had come, you see, and they're trying to go backwards to the law. Uh, and uh, again, it's a backward step. Even though the law was given after promise, the, the, the promise was fulfilled in the seed coming, Christ, and we're justified by believing in him. And so it's taken us backwards. And so the period for which it was given, not permanent, but temporary. And then the parties that are involved when it was given. And so notice again, he tells us in this verse uh, that it was uh, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. And so, of course, we know that the mediator of that covenant was Moses. But what we're seeing here, so God is making this agreement with the nation of, of Israel. They're signing up to it. But in between God and the nation of Israel, you have at least two mediators of the covenant. You have angels who are involved in this giving of the covenant of the law. And then you have, after the angels, you have Moses. And so it's inferior to promise because the promise was made directly to Abraham without any mediators in between. God just told Abraham, in you, all the nations are going to be blessed. I made all the promises concerning his seed and everything directly to Abraham. Whereas here, uh, this is an inferior covenant because it has so many intermediaries, so many mediators. And it is interesting just to, uh, the fact that when you read uh, the giving of the law in Exodus 19, you don't read of any reference to angels. 
which always I find quite startling because the New Testament revelation obviously gives a fuller understanding of what happened and the giving of the law in Mount Sinai. Because as well as here uh, in Galatians, we, we, get, we get this idea of ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. But you also see it. And let's look at a couple of other references. Look at Acts 7. Acts 7 and verse 53, Stephen's magnificent sermon. Acts 7, verse 53, it says, Who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. So again, we've got the idea of angelic intermediaries in the giving of the law. And then one other reference, which is in the epistle to the Hebrews, in chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 2, and verse 2, it says, For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, again speaking of the giving of the law, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? And so, again, just these references to angelic mediators. So the simple point is uh, that the, the law is inferior, uh, not only uh, because of the period in which it was given, but also because the parties involved when it was given. It was necessary to bring these mediators in between God and man. So the covenant of law uh, made great demands on human nature, and the problem is that it was weak through the flesh. Uh, in contrast to the covenant with Abraham, which was unconditional. If you remember when, when we looked last time about that covenant where God went through like a torch uh, between the pieces and Abraham was in a deep sleep. And so the whole point of the, uh, the, the, the promised seed was that it was going to come and it wasn't dependent at all on Abraham. Uh, he was not party to it. And so very different type of covenant to this one that is connected with, with mediators. So inferior in these ways, he says in verse 20, now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. So just an interesting little verse a media is mediator is not a mediator of one. Usually there's two parties and a mediator is somebody who's a third party kind of trying to bring the two other parties together. But then he goes on and says, but God is one. And the idea is this, that when he made the promise, uh, there's no one else involved, right? No mediators. It was a direct promise from God versus the covenant of law where you have a third party involved in it. And so when God, uh, Hebrews 6.13, made promise to Abraham, it says, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself. So what we we're seeing is promise is so much superior because it's a unilateral covenant. Everything depended on God. The covenant with Abraham was in effect between divine persons, really. Uh, there could be no failure. Uh, he's making a promise, and that promise is that from through the line of Abraham, the seed would come through all the blessings would come, the blessings of justification by faith, everything were going to come, and so there's no human involved in that, and therefore it is superior in every way to the law. Now, notice please, in verse 21, he says, is the law then against the promise of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. So law is inferior to promise for the above stated three reasons. But it's also. Uh, but the question is, is it contrary to promise? Is it completely contrary to the promise? And the answer is, God forbid. No, there's a purpose for it. God gave it for a purpose, for there's a definite reason. And so while, as we shall see, the law cannot impart life, as human nature made that impossible, 
although the law is holy and just and good, it's weak through the flesh. He's saying here, if the law could give life, then you'd you'd have two ways to obtain life. One, keeping law, and the other one, by promise and grace. And that's just not possible. The law cannot give life, and again, because of the weakness, our inability to keep it. Remember, yeah, the, the message of law was this do and live. But the difficulty we've learned is that we cannot comply. We cannot do it all. It's not, it's impossible. And so there'd be two methods of which life could be given, but that's just not possible at all. And so he says, uh, if there had been a law given which could have given life, fairly righteousness should have been by the law. But again, we know the law cannot give life. In fact, what the law does, it convicts and condemns. It doesn't give life. It actually brings guilt and uh, it really leaves us uh, in a place where we desperately need a savior. Notice, please, now he says in verse 22, he says, But the scripture hath concluded all on the sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. So what the law did was make the promise more desirable. The law took man's hand, as it were, and led him to the cross and said to him, you need a savior. I like that idea. So the law just really taking man's hand, leading him to the cross and saying, you're a lost sinner, you're a transgressor, you're a lawbreaker, you're a rebel, and you desperately need a savior. And so the scripture concludes, all under sin. Uh, every one of us are shut up, enclosed, locked up, on the sin and the law shown us that shown us what sinners we are the power of sin has become real to us through the law and brought us to this place and so when we see ourselves in that condition deeply convicted uh, by the law of our sinful state then all of a sudden the promise justification by faith in the finished work of christ becomes very beautiful and attractive to us. I need this. <laughs> I need this Savior. And again, we've already seen in our previous session that uh, cursed is everyone that um, doesn't do all the things that are written in the law. Uh, we saw that, and then how Christ was made a curse for us. And so again, just this whole idea of the law showing us our, our brokenness, our failure, and pointing us to the one who was the sinner's substitute who died in our place, the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. And so he says, again in verse 23, but before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Here we're seeing that law was a parenthesis, it wasn't permanent. It was a parenthetical way of God dealing with men. It was given before faith came. We're kept under the law. Now, it's interesting. We just we want to just notice here, just generally, that there's some interesting time markers in verses 23 through 25. So you've got before faith came in verse 23, in verse 25, but after that faith is come. And then notice, we are no longer... <laughs> And so, again, just showing the temporary nature of the law, it's only until uh, the faith should come. So we said it made the law, the law made faith more desirable, made the promise more uh, desirable to us. He says in verse 23, he says, but before faith came, we were kept under the law. And again, just this, this idea of uh, kept in ward. Uh, it, it's a kind of a, a military term. It means... Um, a god or a guardian <clears throat> so <clears throat> we're, we're kept in that place <clears throat> by the law and, and only until shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed so it's kind of like almost like we're held in protective custody uh, and, and kept uh, until the, the law or, or the promise should be revealed 
And so the faith which should afterwards be revealed. So it's a temporary thing. Because faith here, not it's not saying that there wasn't faith in the Old Testament dispensation. We're not saying that at all. But what we're saying is the faith here is in view here. Uh, the, the idea of faith with Christ as its object, because it's all to do with the coming of Christ into the world yeah, as, as the Savior, as the promised seed. And so uh, the idea is that uh, faith here, meaning the faith came uh, in the person of Christ. He's the object. So therefore, we, we saw the word of faith which we preach. Uh, it's faith in the object. It's the object of the Lord Jesus Christ. So held in protective custody, uh, a parenthetical time until Christ should come, uh, who is that redeemer kept in ward until that time. Notice verse 24, it says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. That's the faith that came, you see. Object Christ, faith in him, that we might be justified by faith. And so Paul is introducing a new word now, this idea of a schoolmaster. Actually, uh, it's kind of interesting that it, it's... It's not the best translation because when we think of a schoolmaster, uh, we think of somebody teaching us arithmetic or history, or today it would be uh, uh, the social agenda or whatever, but that's not the idea that's in view here. Um, and so Paul's introducing this new idea of a new direction leading to release from bondage into liberty. And so this schoolmaster really referred to a guide or a guardian or trainer of boys, a function not so much to impart knowledge, but undertake training and discipline. Um, so <clears throat> schoolmaster was usually a slave whose duties uh, was to conduct the boy to and from school. So it's not, again, it's not through his education. It's kind of like a, some people say the best way of, of describing this person would be a strict governor who is given responsibility to govern the child. And so he would conduct the boy to and from school, superintend his conduct, make sure he behaved himself generally, often harsh to the point of cruelty uh, in ancient pictures and uh, picturing this individual, uh, this uh, this governor, he would often be shown with a rod or a cane in his hand. And so the idea is that a, a parent would hand over their child to be kind of governed by this individual. And uh, and so that's what the idea is, that God has, as it were, put us under the law as a governor uh, to bring us to Christ. Uh, that's the purpose, uh, to, to watch over, discipline, correct, until we come to see our need of Christ. And so our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. And so he says, but after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Now, nothing could be clearer than that. In other words, that purpose is over. He, the, his job was to lead us up to Christ. But now Christ has come, we're no longer under a schoolmaster. The language couldn't be clearer. And again, we notice we're talking about before faith came, verse 25, after that faith has come, we're no longer under a schoolmaster. So again, we've got this idea of temporary nature of this dispensation of law. Uh, it was uh, parenthetical. It was had a purpose. It's to show the need of promise, uh, the promised Messiah and our faith in him. And once that had done its work, there was no longer a need or necessity for the schoolmaster. He, he, the schoolmaster, performed during the early life of the child. Once the child reached maturity, his work was done. The law has led us to Christ. Its work has been done. And again, we keep saying the revelation of God has moved on. There can be no turning back. To turn back to law is a disaster. It really is. It's to go back under that cruel governor when we're now reached a place of maturity where we're, we're sons. We're in a far better place. 
And so he says in verse 26, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. And so he's kind of introducing the idea of our new relationship, which is that of sons, adult, mature sons. It's going to be the theme of chapter four. Uh, we're no longer children under this governor, this schoolmaster, but now God is treating us as adult, mature sons. And so the Galatians had come to faith in Christ, and he's asking them, why would you go back? Why would you go back to servitude? Why would you go back under this cruel governor when you've already come to faith in Christ? You've already received the Holy Spirit. You've already received justification by faith. Why would you go back to this, this whole system that was designed to point you to Christ? Why would you go back to the shadows when you have the substance? Why would you want to do that? And again, it's a tragic thing, but I find today uh, there's such an emphasis today on this going back uh, to the law, uh, the people dietary restrictions. And, and again, not for health reasons, because they feel it makes them more spiritual. My wife and I were just talking about someone we knew years ago, and uh, we were <clears throat> a group of us uh, were all given free hams sliced hams for christmas and this one couple they they said well we can't we we don't eat pork now they were believers why would they do that it's a free gift it's a blessing <laughs> we were thankful in those days we were thankful to get meat we were just very thankful but oh no they couldn't do it why because they put themselves back under this bondage system instead of enjoying the freedom of promise and grace and sadly, we find many people today going back under law, putting themselves under bondage, just like the Galatians. In fact, I believe the epistle to the Galatians is needed today as much as ever it was, because there's such a, a almost portrayed as a super spirituality if you put yourself back under law. And uh, it's not indeed, it's, it's, it's going back into your childhood. Uh, it's it's not enjoying being an adult mature son. It's going back into into infancy. It's it's folly to go back. And so he says in verse twenty six, "You're you're children of God by faith in Christ Jesus." And that's they've come to faith in Christ. Why go back to servitude? So verse twenty seven through twenty nine, the law cannot impart the blessings of promise. Everything that we have comes to us through Christ, the, the promised seed, the seed that was promised. And the law can't give us any of these things. And so he's going to talk about the achievements of promise, setting them out in these re remaining verses <clears throat> and to show what we got through promise and how the law can give us none of this, nothing like this. And so he says, for as many as of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. So we can say, first thing, we've put on Christ. We'll talk about what that means in a minute. And then he talks about we're all one in Christ. Uh, it says in verse 28, there's neither Jew nor Greek, uh, bond or free, male or female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. And then verse 29, it says, if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And so this this is what we are as a result of faith in the finished work of Christ, and the law couldn't give us any of this. All the law could do was condemn us. But this is what we've got through promise, these great, amazing truths. So he says, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now, he's not inferring here that there were some of the Galatians that hadn't been baptized. Uh, I just want to say this, that in the New Testament, without contradiction when somebody got saved they got baptized and it was usually immediately the the concept of an unbaptized believer was absolutely foreign to the new testament and, and so it usually happened immediately upon profession of faith and we have been going through the book of acts in our own assembly and we've been pointing that out every time somebody gets saved they get baptized uh, and so paul here is referring to their baptism, some people, uh, our ultra-dispensationalist friends would say there's not a drop of water in Romans 6, or there's not a drop of water here. Uh, I think they're, 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 they're 
washing with water. I think they're full of water, but I think the idea is that our baptism is showing what happened to us the day that we were saved. Okay, so it's acting out the reality of what happened the minute that we came to faith in Christ. And so what happened when we were saved? As many of you has have been baptized into Christ, have been put into Christ. <clears throat> so it's talking about our union with Christ, where we're, we're united with him. Uh, in a sense, when somebody's baptized, they're put under the water, it's like, Th their their whole old life disappears, and when they come up the other, uh, out of the water, their new life identified with that risen man. That's the picture that's being given. W the old man died. The new man is risen with Christ, and so we're now identified fully with Christ. We're in union with Christ. And one of the great words of Paul is, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. This is our position. This is our standing, our union with Christ. And not only that, we've put on Christ. He is our righteousness. Christ is our, our righteousness now is Christ. We've put on Christ. And so Paul refers to their baptism in this connection, uh, teaching their identification with Christ, our standing in Christ as sons of God, we're identified with the Son of God. It, so that, that's our position. That's where we are. And so he, he's calling them to remember their baptism uh, as a picture of what had happened the day they were saved. Isn't it amazing that now you're united with the risen man forever? <laughs> that's your new identity. And you, you, you've put on Christ. Uh, that's your... Uh, how God views you now. When he looks at you, he sees you in Christ. He doesn't see you as this lawbreaker under condemnation, but he sees us. Uh, Christ is our righteousness. We've put on Christ. He's, he's our righteousness. So we're, uh, un we're united with Christ. Uh, we're in union with him. Uh, that's our new identity. Uh, we're seen as those that have put on Christ. And so it reminds him of all these things. And again, how did that come? Through faith, through believing in what Christ had done on Calvary's cross for them, for seeing them as lost sinners, for seeing Christ as the one who bore the curse for them, believing that that's what brought this transformation. And then verse 28, this idea of we're all one in Christ, it's speaking of our standing before God. In the ancient world, uh, there's no question here that Jews had advantages over Gentiles. What advantage the Jew? Well, he's got the oracles of God. He's got all these other things. I mean, he's just, he, he's been blessed, a blessed nation in many ways. Uh, also, uh, a free man would have great advantages over a man who's still a slave. And then, of course, in the ancient world, a man, a male, would have great advantages over a female. But at the foot of the cross, all those things disappear in the sense that now, uh, whether you're a slave or a free man, uh, whether you're a Jew or a Greek, uh, whether you're a male or a female, you're all one in Christ as far as your standing before God is concerned on the basis of justification by faith. No advantages in any of these things uh, were basically uh, faith unites us in a common standing before God. And this is not even talking about gathering. I mean, we're one with every true believer throughout the world in Christ, in our standing before God, right? There's this unity of every believer in their standing before God. And, and it's a wonderful uh, position to be in. That's our standing. So faith unites believers in a common standing before God. The distinctions, of course, still exist elsewhere. Uh, we, we recognize that the Jew and Gentile distinction still exists nationally, but in the church, it doesn't. It's gone, right? And, and we need to remember that. Uh, Jews have no advantage. I remember preaching in London and uh, on the Levitical offerings and a Jew was in the congregation he had believed in christ he was now a believer but a young believer and he was blown away 
in giving an, being given an understanding of the offerings that he had never known before. And so here's a Gentile, in a sense, instructing a, a Jewish convert in the offerings as pictures of Christ. And you think, wow, this is amazing. No no advantage. He had no advantage over me. Where, uh, now, as far as our standing before God is concerned, no advantage. But in the world, we obviously recognize there's a difference between a Jew and a Gentile on a, on a national and even international level in society. Sadly, although slavery was abolished, there are still slaves uh, in the world today many and uh, uh, many who are indentured people even in this country i was talking to somebody the other day about people that are brought over here and uh, promised uh, you know that they're going to be given uh, citizenship but they end up you know kind of never being able to pay back uh, their debt and they become indentured slaves working in sweatshops in their whole life they're slaves it's still going on in our society um there's still distinctions between male and female, even in assembly government. As far as God's grace is concerned, we're all on the same level. We're all one in Christ. We know that. But as far as God's government is concerned, clearly there are distinctions between male and female in the assembly. Our standing is the same, but in terms of our service within the body of Christ, Right, we have male leadership. We have ministry uh, that uh, the the men are to give, women are to be silent in the church. Those all those are biblical principles as far as God's government is concerned. As far as God's grace is concerned, we're all on the same level, no advantage. And so, our standing before God, um, all those distinctions are gone. A Jew, a master, a man have no advantage over a Gentile, a servant, or a woman. In, in grace, it is an amazing thing. Every wall and every barrier is swept away, all one in Christ. And it's wonderful when you see examples of that, when you see this, this amazing unity that there is uh, with people who once had tremendous hostility towards each other, but now this oneness that comes in Christ. And so these are the great blessings that are ours. So in the gospel, God's grace, no distinctions. Everybody is welcome at the foot of the cross. In God's government, we do know there are different roles. And we need to re recognize that. Verse 29, it says, And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. All believers, without national, social, or sexual distinctions, are now heirs according to the promise. Abraham's seed refers to our identification with him as a man or woman who is justified by faith. It's not that we become spiritual Israelites or anything like that, but we are forever connected, in a sense, with Abraham's seed in the sense that we, like Abraham, have exercised faith. <laughs> and that's a, a wonderful thing. And so we're Abraham's seed, uh, and we're heirs according to the promise. And again, this promised seed, through him all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And we, we have so many blessings now, uh, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. I mean, amazing, our new position that we find ourselves in. And it's all as a re direct result of the uh, believing in the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior because of his work for us on the cross. Now, having brought these truths out, particularly uh, I want to think about this idea of sonship rather than slaves, because he says you're all the children or some translations have you're all the sons of God by faith in Christ Jesus in verse 26. And when we get into chapter 4, he wants to develop that. And he wants to develop it by dealing with the topic of adoption. And uh, the subject of sonship and heirship, uh, which chapter 3 concludes with. Uh, so we're, we're heirs according to the promise. We're, we're sons now. So he wants to develop that idea of being sons and heirs. 
And so uh, chapter four takes that up. And it's amazing, by the way, isn't it, for us to be in this glorious position as sons and heirs, no longer slaves, no longer servants, that in order for us to be brought to this place of this great position of sons and heirs of God, the Lord Jesus, in order to accomplish our sonship, the Lord Jesus became a servant. <laughs> Thinking of Philippians chapter 2, uh, you know, how, how he came into this world and made himself a servant. And amazing to think so that we might be sons and heirs. And so, again, we're just thankful for the Lord Jesus. One of the tragedies of legalism is it gives the appearance of spiritual maturity when in reality it leaves the, leads the believer backwards into a second childhood of Christian experience. And that's the thought that's going to be brought before us in chapter 4, that it's like deciding I'm going to go back and be a child again rather than enjoying being an heir and a son. Now, as we, we look at chapter 4 and begin our study on this chapter, I don't want to get too far into it, but I, I want to just say that I don't think there's a subject more misunderstood in terms of New Testament doctrine than the doctrine of adoption. And I think part of the reason is that we, we take our teaching on adoption from what we see in contemporary culture rather than what was happening biblically. And so in contemporary culture, I was sat next to a, um, a man on uh, my flight to Calgary yesterday, and he and his wife had gone to Kazakhstan, and they had adopted a child from Kazakhstan. This child was not in their family, and they went, they picked this child, and they put it into their family. And so that is the view that has been adopted, if you like, into our view of biblical adoption it's completely foreign to the new testament because in the new testament you get into the family not by adoption but by birth how do you get saved talk to this uh, mennonite uh, girl yesterday uh, in the airport my wife and i were talking with her and she asked us uh, two questions um, because uh, she she was kind of curious to know who we were, what we believed. She says, do you believe in the new birth? We said, yes, we do. And then she said, uh, a second question, do you believe that God eternally exists in three persons? I said, yes, we believe it. Isn't that amazing? That, that was very encouraging uh, that we had that conversation. And so um, the first question, do you believe in the new birth? And the idea is this, how do I get into the family of God? You must be born again. You don't get in by adoption. You get in by birth. Just as we were in Adam's family by birth, we are get into our new family also by birth, by the new birth. Adoption has got nothing to do with us getting into the family. We're already, if we've believed in the finished work of Christ on Calvary, you're in the family. Adoption has an altogether different meaning. And because it's going to take me more than four minutes to describe it, I'm going to stop at this point because uh, hopefully it's going to whet your appetite on understanding biblical adoption next time and hopefully we'll correct wrong thinking on that important topic. May the Lord bless his word to us this morning. Amen.